Reminder, please turn all cell phones off or have them in the silent position. Yeah, he's in trial. I think, I think uh, Judge Leonard is good. He's going to let him come up? Mm -hmm. Just let us know. Okay, thanks, Sean. Thank
All rise. Spirit Court of Clark County is now in session. On the Mayor Staley Clark presiding. Please be seated and turn all the cell phones off. <sighs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I've already. Uh, Press had some inquiries about whether they needed Rule 22s again, and I didn't see any reason for that, so we can dispatch with that. Uh, prior objections can be noted for the record. Will that be sufficient for the defense? Yes, ma'am. Very good. Um, we are here to conduct the sentencing in the case of the State of Georgia versus Justin Ross Harris. Brian, do you have a copy of the Bill of Indictment? Thank you. This is General Bill of Indictment, State of Georgia versus Justin Ross Harris, uh, General Bill of Indictment number 143124. Um, the case was tried during the months of September, October, and November uh, in Glen County, Brunswick, Georgia, where the case had been um, uh, moved uh, and the venue changed. Uh, for purposes of um, finding a jury in March of this year, um, three weeks were spent trying to find a qualified juror in, jury in Cobb County, pool of jury, jurors in Cobb County. Uh, that was not able to be accomplished, although the effort to do so um, was a strong effort. There's nothing else to be said, but it was a very strong effort. It did not occur, and the case was transferred uh, to Brunswick to the Brunswick Judicial Circuit, uh, Glen County. First, I want to say that, um, and I want to thank the Brunswick Judicial Service Circuit for their help and hospitality during the trial of the case of the state of Georgia versus Justin Ross Harris. And I particularly want to thank the judges of the Brunswick Judicial Circuit for allowing us to come and showing extraordinary um, support and help and extremely high levels of professionalism. I particularly want to recognize Chief Judge E.M. Wilkes and Judges Stephen Scarlett, Stephen Kelly, Roger Lane, and Anthony Harrison and their excellent support staff. I also want to thank Glen County Sheriff Neil Jump and the deputies assigned uh, to our trial in Brunswick and the bailiffs as well. And I need to recognize Cobb County Sheriff Neil Warren and Colonel Robert Willard and Lieutenant Keith Raines who provided our security detail in Brunswick. I also need to recognize some of our Cobb County Court Administration folks who made all the difference, uh, particularly during jury selection. Um, Court Administrator Tom Sharon and uh, Bill Pardue and Bob Pierce. And David Tyler with Cobb TV 23 who worked with the press and made that interface seamless. I want to recognize the excellent legal representation both sides of this case received, the state of Georgia and the defendant, Justin Ross Harris. I want to recognize from the district attorney, Vic Reynolds' office, Chuck Boring, Jesse Evans, and Susan Treadaway. And I want to recognize for the defense, Maddox Kilgore, Brian Lumpkin, and Carlos Rodriguez. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it was a professional pleasure to work with you under trying circumstances exacerbated by two hurricanes. Now, before we take evidence and argument, I want to clarify for the defendant and the public the sentencing parameters based on this bill of indictment. I want to turn our attention to count one of the bill of indictment. That will be the count of uh, malice murder to which the jury has found the defendant guilty. Mr. Boyne, what do you contend are the sentencing parameters? Uh, Judge, I believe uh, for that count, the parameters are either life with the possibility of parole or a life without the possibility of parole. <coughs> Does the defense agree or disagree? We agree. Count two. Uh, Your Honor, I believe count two as a matter of law is vacated by law, so there would be no sentence for count two. And as, do you agree or disagree with that? We agree. Count three. 
Uh, Your Honor, count three as well would be vacated as a matter of law, so there would be no sentence for that count. Does the defense agree or disagree? We agree. Count four? Your Honor, that's a possible sentence of uh, up to five to 20 years in prison, and I believe that can run either concurrent or consecutive to count one. Agree or disagree? We would argue it merges as a matter of fact. We're going to have to take an argument on that. As to count five? Uh, Your Honor, I believe count five would merge into count four, so there would be uh, no sentence for count five. All right. Count six? Count six. Your Honor, if that's a criminal attempt of a criminal statute, it would be uh, one to ten years in prison on count six. With the possibility of parole? Yes, Your Honor, and that could either run concurrent or consecutive to counts one uh, and four. Do you agree or disagree? Count seven and eight are both misdemeanors. That's correct, Judge. And again, those would be with possibility of parole and could run either concurrent or consecutive to the other counts. Of course, the defendant has already served that. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. All right, let's take the argument then on merger as to count four. Um, I think it would be in the nature in the nature of argument, the defense should start. We have no argument. Simply our position emerges as a matter of fact. What says the state? Uh, Your Honor, I would cite to uh, Lupo versus the state, L U P O E. Uh, that is a November 21st, 2016 uh, decision by the, uh, the, the Georgia Supreme Court uh, discussing merger in cases where the underlying felony, in this case two and three, are vacated as a matter of law. When those counts are vacated, the underlying felonies then are not necessarily, do not necessarily merge. Uh, in this case, it was armed robbery, aggravated assault, and other acts or other crimes charged that did not merge as a matter of law into malice murder. Uh, both crimes had different elements. But Your Honor, also cite to uh, Noel versus the state, which is 297 Georgia 698, uh, 2015 Georgia Supreme Court uh, decision that actually involves a uh, case involving uh, felony murder conviction where other felony murders were uh, vacated as a matter of law. One of the underlying uh, felonies for the felony murder was a cruelty to children in the first degree. This was a child homicide. The Supreme Court held in that case that the cruelty to children in the first degree did not uh, merge as their under the, the felony that was charged as, as a homicide based on that cruelty was vacated. Thus, uh, there, the Supreme Court actually said it needed to be sent back for resentencing because there should have been a sentence exacted on the cruelty to children. That's exactly what we have here. Any further argument of the defense? No, ma'am. I find that um, because the because of the convictions in counts two and three being vacated as a matter of law, uh, in count four there is no merger, and therefore the sentencing parameters are five to twenty years. Um, and I note the defendant's exception to the court's ruling. All right. I believe we're at a point where we can begin to take evidence in aggravation and mitigation. Does the state have anything to say before we do that? We have no further evidence than what was put out of trial, Judge. And for the defense? No evidence. All right. And then we have argument. Oh, we can proceed with argument. I'm ready to hear what you all have to say. For the defense. We have no argument. You need to be standing up when you speak to me. We have no argument. Thank you. And your argument. Just for appellate purposes, I think it's, I, we all understand why the defense would be doing that, but just as a matter of record, we'd ask them, I'd put on the record, this is a matter of trial strategy. They discussed it with Mr. Harris, and they're making the trial strategy decision not to present uh, any mitigation evidence at this time. Mr. Kilgore. I, I don't have to do that and choose not to. Okay. Well, I'll put it on the record and I'll speak to Mr. Harris directly. Mr. Harris, you have a right at this time to offer evidence in mitigation. You can call witnesses. They can be put up for uh, the purposes of testimony. Um, the nature of mitigating evidence is... Mitigating or extenuating facts or circumstances are those that do not constitute a justification or excuse for the offense. 
but that in fairness and mercy may be considered as extenuating or reducing the degree of moral culp culpability or blame. Um, evidence such as that is generally along the lines of lack of a prior conviction, uh, youth of uh, an offender, um, circumstances such as uh, perhaps drug addiction or something along those lines. And every defendant is entitled to have that presented in a sentencing hearing before a court considers an appropriate sentence if they wish. They can put up evidence. If there is no evidence, the evidence of the trial can be considered just as for the state in the nature of um, uh, aggravating evidence. and. Um, Whether to do so or not is a defendant's choice after consultation with counsel. So I want to make sure that you heard what I just said to you. Did you hear what I said? Yes, sir. Have you com consulted with your attorneys about this? Yes, right. Uh, if you have any disagreement with the way it's being conducted, now is the time to speak. All right. All right. Is there anything else the state has concerns of? No, Judge, I believe that handles that. I'd like to proceed. Um, yeah, Judge. There's not much to argue or say in this case. I think the evidence that was presented at trial and the jury's verdict um, basically says it all. Um, the evidence showed that this defendant was driven by selfishness and committed in an unspeakable act against his own flesh and blood in this case. Um, because of his behavior, a 22-month-old child was killed. A uh, child's death in the most torturous, horrific, unimaginable way possible. Because of that judge, and because there is absolutely no mitigation in this case, there is no justification. Uh, this is basically the most aggravated uh, type of killing of another individual, specifically a young child. Uh, and I think that based upon the evidence that came out in the acts of this defendant, that there's only one sentence that reflects the, the evil nature of what he did. So, uh, Your Honor, we're going to ask for a sentence the maximum allowed by law. Uh, we would ask for, on count one, the defendant to be sentenced to a, a term of life, uh, that that be served without parole. Um, I would ask that in count four, cruelty to children in the first degree, the defendant be sentenced to a term of 20 years to serve, and for that to run consecutive to count one. I would ask that count six, uh, the defendant be sentenced to 10 years to serve, and that 10 years be to serve consecutive counts one and four. Count seven, he'd be sentenced to 12 months to serve. That that be, uh, he'd be sentenced to uh, that term to run consecutive to counts one, four, and six. And that count uh, eight, the defendant also be sentenced to 12 months to serve, to run consecutive to counts one, four, six, and seven. Uh, Judge, that would be a, a sum total of life in prison without parole, uh, plus 32 years to serve consecutively. I believe that the evidence in this case and the jury's finding that this man intentionally killed his child in the worst way possible uh, necessitates this sentence and only this sentence.
Well, the defendant, Just Rawson Harris, has been, been found guilty by a Green County jury of all counts in this bill of indictment, and that includes malice murder uh, of his 22-month-old son, Cooper Harris, and felony murder of his 22-month-old son, Cooper Harris. He's also been found guilty of the underlying felonies and misdemeanors. It now becomes my duty to determine what punishment will be imposed for these offenses. In arriving at this determination, I am authorized to consider all of the evidence received in court during the trial of the case, except for any evidence that was offered for a limited purpose. I am by law to consider the facts and circumstances of extenuation and mitigation of punishment, if any, as well as evidence and aggravation of punishment. The court should be mindful that mitigating or extenuating facts or circumstances or those that do not constitute a justification or excuse for the offense, but that in fairness and mercy may be considered as extenuating or reducing the degree of moral culpability or blame, uh, except for the fact that the defendant has no prior criminal conviction. There is no mitigating uh, fact or circumstance in this case. The aggravating circumstances are those that increase the guilt or enormity of the offense or adds to its injurious consequence. This court finds particularly that the defendant, Just, Justin Ross Harris, intentionally and unnecessarily in a wanton manner caused and inflicted upon the defendant, excuse me, the victim, Cooper Harris, unnecessary and wanton, severe physical and mental pain and agony. The evidence uh, in aggravation in this case is replete uh, by the evidence presented during in their deliberations. They asked to uh, review evidence that was of concern to them and it was done so in open court. Um, when they came back into the courtroom to render their verdict and they were polled by the court and asked if in fact that was their verdict in the jury room and if it was still their verdict, each stood and each unequivocally said yes, it was. There was no hesitancy, there was no reservation, there was no indirectness in their answers at all. They fairly um, deliberated and discharged their duties uh, and found the defendant guilty of what factually was a horrendous, horrific uh, experience for this 22-month-old child who had been placed in the trust of his father in violation and dereliction of um, duty to that child, if not love of that child, callously walked away and left that child in a hot car in June in Georgia in the summer to swelter and die. The state's recommendation is the very least that anyone could deem just under the circumstances of this case, and I will follow the recommendation. Mr. Phillips, if you'll do the paperwork, please. Yeah. Oh, um, if the parties would approach. And the defendant. Take it back to him, Judge. No, I want him. I want him up here for bench. for sentencing, please. Yes, and thank you.
All right, Judge, these have been signed, and as to, um, as to form, I think it clearly reflects what you said. Thank you for that, Mr. Kelp. I, I didn't Kelp read the habeas rights to it, though. I'll do that. Okay. The court pronounces the following sentence in the case of the State of Georgia versus Justin Ross Harris, criminal action 1493124. As to count one, the court imposes the sentence of, as to malice murder, uh, with the jury having found the defendant guilty, sentence of the court is life to serve in confinement without parole. As to count two, felony murder, guilty, it's vacated by law due to the conviction on count one. As to count three, felony murder, disposition by the jury of guilty, uh, it is also vacated by law due to conviction on count one. As to count four, cruelty to children in the first degree, uh, the jury having found the defendant guilty, the sentence of the court is 20 years to serve in confinement. This will be consecutive to count one, malice murder, life to serve in confinement without parole. Count five, cruelty to children in the second degree, the jury having found the defendant guilty, it will merge into count four as a matter of law. As to count six, criminal attempt to commit a felony to wit, sexual exploitation of children. Uh, with a disposition by the jury of guilty, the court imposes a sentence of 10 years to serve in confinement, consecutive to counts one and four. As to count seven, dissemination of harmful material to minors, with the jury having found the defendant guilty, the court imposes a sentence of 12 months to serve in confinement, consecutive to counts one, four, and six. And as to count eight, dissemination of harmful material to minors, the jury having found the defendant guilty, the court imposes a sentence of 12 months to serve in confinement, consecutive to counts one, four, and uh, six, and seven. Mr. Harris, this is to advise you that you have the right to file any action for habeas corpus brought pursuant to Title IX, Chapter 14, Article 2 of the Official Code of Georgia. It must be filed within one year from the judgment of conviction on misdemeanors or four years from the judgment of conviction on felonies becoming final by the conclusion of direct review or the expiration of the time for seeking such review. That would be the fifth day of December. 2016. You also have a right uh, to appellate review. I know that you've discussed that with counsel because you and I have discussed that previously. So let this serve to remind you that you have um, 30 days in which to file the first steps toward appellate review. Mr. Kilgore has already advised the court that he either has or will, I would assume will, file um, a motion for new trial and take the appropriate appellate steps. Is that still your intent, Mr. Kilgore? Yes, ma'am. I'm going to take care of it. I appreciate that. My final observation is this, um, Mr. Harris. Um, I went back and reviewed and thought about your statement to the police and your statement to your wife when you were taken into custody. And it stood out to me that in both of those, you took the occasion to express your wish that you would be an advocate so that people would never do this again to their children. And I would say, perhaps not in the way that you intended, but you in fact have accomplished that goal. Anything else for the state? No, Your Honor. Anything else for the defense? You can take the defendant into custody. And just wait a second. Let's get him out. All right. If there is no other business by the state or the defense for the court, no, Your Honor. there being none, we stand in recess.
to render their verdict, and they were polled by the court and asked if, in fact, that was their verdict in the jury room, and if it was still their verdict, each stood and each unequivocally said, yes, it was. There was no hesitancy, there was no reservation, there was no indirectness in their answers at all. They fairly um, deliberated and discharged their duties uh, and found the defendant guilty of what factually was a horrendous, horrific uh, experience for this 22-month-old child who had been placed in the trust of his father in violation and dereliction of um, duty to that child, if not love of that child, callously walked away and left that child in a hot car in June in Georgia in the summer to swelter and die. The state's recommendation is the very least that anyone could deem just under the circumstances of this case, and I will follow the recommendation. Mr. Phillips, if you'll do the paperwork, please. Okay. Um, if the parties would approach. And the defendant. You want me to take it back to him, Judge? No, I want him, I want him up here for, for sentencing, please. Yes, and thank you. Judge, these have been signed, and as to um, as to form, I think it clearly reflects what you said. Thank you for that, Mr. Kelly. I, I didn't the habeas rights to it, though. I'll do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The court pronounces the following sentence in the case of the State of Georgia versus Justin Ross Harris, criminal action fourteen nine three one two four. As to count one, the court imposes the sentence of, as to malice, murder, uh, with the jury having found the defendant guilty, sentence of the court is life to serve in confinement without parole. As to count two, felony murder, guilty, it's vacated by law due to the conviction on count one. As to count three, felony murder, disposition by the jury of guilty, uh, it is also vacated by law due to conviction on count one. As to count four, cruelty to children in the first degree, uh, the jury having found the defendant guilty, the sentence of the court is 20 years to serve in confinement. This will be consecutive to count one, malice murder, life to serve in confinement without parole. Count five, cruelty to children in the second degree, the jury having found the defendant guilty, it will merge into count four as a matter of law. As to count six, criminal attempt to commit a felony to wit, sexual exploitation of children. Uh, with a disposition by the jury of guilty, the court imposes a sentence of 10 years to serve in confinement, consecutive to counts one and four. 
as to count seven, dissemination of harmful material to minors. With the jury having found the defendant guilty, the court imposes a sentence of 12 months to serve in confinement consecutive to counts one, four, and six. And as to count eight, dissemination of harmful material to minors, the jury having found the defendant guilty, the court imposes a sentence of 12 months to serve in confinement consecutive to counts one, four, and uh, six, and seven. Mr. Harris, this is to advise you that you have the right to file any action for habeas corpus brought pursuant to Title IX, Chapter 14, Article 2 of the Official Code of Georgia. It must be filed within one year from the judgment of conviction on misdemeanors or four years from the judgment of conviction on felonies becoming final by the conclusion of direct review or the expiration of the time for seeking such review. That would be the fifth day of December. 2016. You also have a right uh, to appellate review. I know that you've discussed that with counsel because you and I have discussed that previously. So let this serve to remind you that you have um, 30 days in which to file the first steps toward appellate review. Mr. Kilgore has already advised the court that he either has or will, I would assume will, file um, a motion for new trial and take the appropriate appellate steps. Is that still your intent, Mr. Kilgore? Yes, ma'am. We'll take care of it. I appreciate that. My final observation is this, um, Mr. Harris. Um, I went back and reviewed and thought about your statement to the police and your statement to your wife when you were taken into custody. And it stood out to me that in both of those you took the occasion that in both of those you took the occasion to express your wish that you would be an advocate so that people would never do this again to their children. And I would say, perhaps not in the way that you intended, but you in fact have accomplished that goal. Anything else for the state? No, Your Honor. Anything else for the defense? You can take the defendant into custody. And just wait a second. Let's get him out. All right, and now we're waiting for a press conference from, it looks like, the uh, defense attorneys here in the Harris trial case. If not, hopefully the state will speak. So we're going to continue to monitor this live video in the courthouse. Check audio, check Tony, audio, check Tony. Uh, we'll need the speakers, but we got a spaceship above us. Seriously. Okay. Here we go, ready. We're ready. Are you ready? 
Aye. 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 Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I, I know most of you in this room. I'm Vic Reynolds, the elected district attorney of the Cobb Judicial Circuit. I really don't have much of a prepared statement today. We'll certainly take any questions that we believe we can appropriately and ethically and legally answer. Uh, as I stated back on November 14th, this is a verdict that no one in this office celebrates. It's, it's not a case that we consider a victory. It's a case that uh, as I mentioned previously in November, uh, where our goal was singular in nature, and that was simply to do everything possible uh, in a courtroom to seek justice on behalf of Cooper Harris. And as I said in November uh, in Brunswick, we believe that goal was accomplished, and we certainly believe this sentence today was appropriate. So based upon that, any questions you may want to direct toward me or toward Chuck or any of the trial team, we'll certainly do our best to answer some. I think I know you're the district attorney, and this ultimately um, is in your hands. Do you regret now or have any second thoughts about not seeking the death penalty in this case? You, you know, I, I don't, Ross. Uh, uh, in looking at a death penalty case, there's basically two factors that I look at. One is from a legal perspective, and, and by that I mean uh, are there aggravating factors in a case uh, although it's not written, my general policy is I, I minimally want two or more aggravating factors in a case. This certainly had one, just the nature of, of, of the facts and what happened to young Cooper would have qualified in that regard. But as you heard her honor state a moment ago, this defendant had no prior history. Uh, there were no additional victims or anything of that nature. And so we didn't really find another aggravating factor. Second, in all candor, this was an unusual case. Uh, that this was a case where the factual pattern had, had not been um, sought, at least from what we could find in Georgia, uh, on a malice murder conviction before, although we felt very strongly about it. You still don't know what a jury will do. And so uh, based uh, when the case came to us in the summer of 2014, we reviewed it very closely. I had a number of the more experienced review it. In fact, lawyers who were not involved in the actual day-to-day -day prosecution audit reviewed it factually as well. Uh, unanimously, they came back to me and, and said that it was an appropriate case to seek a life without parole in, and that was our ultimate goal in the case. So no, I, 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 don't, I, I don't regret it. I don't look back uh, in hindsight at 2020 at those type of decisions. I think it was appropriate at the time, and I think this sentence is appropriate today. Judge Staley made a comment to Mr. Harris when she was sentencing that he had wanted to keep this from happening again and maybe not the way he planned on it. The message you see from this sentence, what happened here today as far as Mr. Harris, as far as life without parole, is it sending a message? Do you think this does tell people out there this is not, I mean, obviously you don't want to do this, but is this, what, what message do you see from the sentence? You know, I, I'm not sure. Uh, it's difficult for me to answer whether or not it sends a message. I, I hope it does. I will tell you that, uh, uh, you know, we, we hope and pray in this office that every parent uh, will make sure that he or she is very careful about uh, the circumstances of a child in a car. We know um, and we learned, I learned uh, in the pendency of this case that on occasion accidents happen. Uh, they do. Uh, but this wasn't an accident. Uh, we categorically, unequivocally were convinced f from literally the very first day that this was uh, an act that was done uh, with m minimally negligence to begin with and then malice as the investigation ran its course. And so I, I do think in some ways it's accomplished the goal of making people very, very aware in this community uh, uh, throughout the metropolitan Atlanta area probably in the state of Georgia and maybe even further on a national level of, of the fact that you have to be extremely careful and cautious when, when uh, placing your child in, in a car seat and making sure that you don't in any way forget that circumstance or forget that child is there. But again, uh, this case we believe, uh, and a jury I think spoke very strongly and convincingly that they believed it as well, that this was not an accident, this was an absolute intentional act. I don't know if it's for you, Mr. Reynolds, or Mr. Sure. Warren, you may want to answer, but in the statement you mentioned that the defense not bringing any arguments was a defense strategy. Can you elaborate and explain <clears throat> when you said it was a strategy, what that is or was? Well, what, I, what I can only, whoop, excuse me. Uh, 
from an appellate standpoint, a lot of times we have cases when we, we look back at it, they're brought up appeals that, you know, the defense could have put forward uh, mitigating circumstances or something at sentencing. And cases have been reversed where the defense does not put up uh, any evidence in mitigation or anything like that. Uh, here we, we understood uh, maybe they chose to do that for some other reason, not to, I guess, give up maybe information they want to use on appeal or things like that, but to get them on the record so they have been faced, Mr. Harris has been faced, like, hey, I do know that we have this opportunity, and it's not just due to laziness or forgetfulness or something like that on the part of defense counsel. It's a decision they are making after talking with their client. So that, that's the reason for bringing that up and putting it on the record because five years down the road, 10 years down the road, you're in another habeas court somewhere else if this case is on appeal and, and you don't know what the arguments are gonna be made. Chuck, can you, can you expound on what uh, Vic said earlier about this being an unusual case? I mean, normally we cover murders with knives and guns. This didn't have either one of those. Mm -hmm. how, how unusual is this and how challenging for you? Oh, it was very challenging in that, I mean, it's almost like you prove a, proving a negative to start with. You know, you see all this evidence, evidence circumstantially, just the minimum part of it, and you, you realize, and you start looking at it, you know, did this person do this intentionally? And so you have to start from that standpoint. It's not like you have a, a murder on video or a shooting or anything like that. It's the mechanism of injury, and I think the level of evil it took to commit this type of act also is something different than we usually see. Because usually there's a reason, and while it's still murder, okay, you got ripped off in a drug deal, or there's domestic violence or something like that. This case was so far different than what we usually see in our homicide cases. And you and I have talked before, what feeling or comments did you get from the jurors about the, how they handled that evidence and, and absorbed it? Uh, I think they absorbed it uh, in a very systematic way. I think the first day, talking to the four person and a couple other people, uh, the first day they were kind of, you know, working their way through how do they go through this process. And then they uh, created a plan where they were going to go through and discuss each issue. And when they did it, each juror was going to be allowed to have their say so no one would feel like they were left out of being able to deliberate. But when speaking with them, uh, they, they didn't seem to have they were very thorough in their examination of the evidence, but they really didn't have a lot of questions about the evidence once they had gone through it. Chuck, this is the max sentence. It's one thing to win the case, but then for attorneys, um, the, the sentencing is sort of the finality of this. What's your reaction to that? I, I really think it's the only sentence that reflects the verdict in this case. I don't think you could have any other sentence that would be appropriate. Uh, when somebody's been convicted of intentionally taking the life of a 22-month-old child, not only doing that, but doing it in such a painful, deliberate way. To follow up on what Debbie just said, reporters learn that we put stories behind us because, as I tell my wife, if we don't go crazy, we'd go crazy. Looking at this case, is this something that's going to be with you for a while? Do you, can you put this behind you, or do you need time to work out what, mm -hmm. what basically what happens? Yeah, I don't think... You, anybody involved in this case will ever be able to put it behind them, so to speak. I think we're all going to keep it with us for one reason or another. Different things we may have learned about the case, about evidentiary issues that came up that we've never encountered before that we had to research. Um, it was just such a, 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 an overwhelming case as far as the investigation. Things that we learned that we could have done differently maybe. I think in, in that respect we're always going to keep that with us. But I think also you know, everybody involved in this case is going to remember it because of that victim. And so we'll move on and we'll keep doing our jobs and we'll keep seeking justice for children and victims of crime. Uh, so in that regard, we're going to move on, but I don't think any of us will move on or forget this. Anything else, guys? Thank you all so much. Thank you.